I was considered, when I was a little kid, like age seven, eight, nine years old, to be a great genius on the violin. I was going to be a violinist. When I was like 10 or 11, I heard Heifetz at the Mormon Tabernacle. And I said, <laughs> I guess I, I'll go to the, my other possibility, which I, I was good at math. So I'll, I'll be a scientist or an engineer because there's no way that I'm going to learn to play like that. Extraordinary. Innovative, humorous, just genuinely nice. There's just no one like him. He combines the quickness of mind, an incredible memory, and, uh, and he sees connections where very few people do, I think. And he has a fairly unique ability to project into the future and do it very accurately. With a Ph.D. from Caltech at 26 years old, Cy Ramo would lead GE's development of radar science and microwave systems. We uh, both started out as engineers. Cy and Dean Woldridge together had left Hughes and started a little company called Ramo Woldridge, just a half a block off Sepulveda in what had formerly been a, a barber shop. And there Cy offered me a job and I jumped at it. Uh, just so taken with Cy as a technical leader. Ramo and Woolridge's plan was to continue research in aerospace and electronics. But our nation was engaged in the Cold War, and the president had other ideas for this young company. President Eisenhower telephoned me, and I knew he would not know who I was, but he would be told Cy Ramo was the guy to get for what you say is the number one project in the nation. I was asked, can we do an ICBM? Can we do it ahead of the Russians? Should we start that program? We couldn't allow them to alone be able to knock out the United States in 20 minutes. About a week after I showed up for work, uh, my clearance came through and I asked Cy, I said, what's my job? He said, we're going to build a rocket that goes 5,000 miles and can hit within a mile of the target. And I was so naive, I said, good thing, let's get on it. And I didn't begin to realize how hard it was, but I, I learned soon. There was such a stretch in every one of the 10 major technical problems that had to be solved in the ICBM program. It was not at all clear that you could do it. Most people didn't think it could ever work. The science and the technology weren't there to make it work. And Cy knew that they would be able to make it work by dent of hard work. Two, one. As the technical advisors to the Air Force, that really was the genesis of uh, Raymond Wildridge Corporation, which eventually became TRW. And for the next 50 years, TRW applied Ramos's systems engineering approach to some of the most spectacular engineering feats ever witnessed. Ramos's passion for engineering led to a new challenge. He wanted engineering and the accomplishments that engineers contribute in service to our nation to be recognized. In 1964, Cy Ramo led the effort to establish the National Academy of Engineering. That's why the nation has been so appreciative and why the Academies of Engineering is so appreciative of this man and his life's work. He seems to be able to get people to work very, very hard because they want to, not because they have to, because they're thrilled with the prospect of achievement which he lays before them. He's just a leader, and he's a leader that knows how to use humor. And if you don't see the company in management, it seems to me you miss something very important in management. If you miss something important in management, you shouldn't be a manager. Ramo shares his wit and wisdom through his technical and mainstream writings. His tennis book is uh, probably his best known book. I mean, it, it's all about strategy, and Cy is a great strategist. The company is very anxious for me to do a, a short little book on what is the systems approach in engineering. I plan to dictate that little book on the afternoon of the Sunday on which I was playing tennis in the morning. And I dictated stuff that I'd given talks about. 
but I still had in mind all the dumb things I'd done on a tennis court. An ordinary tennis player thinks he should emulate the pros, do what they do, even though you can't do it as well. So you throw the ball up very high for your serve, get your racket way back, and as hard as you can, you hit that ball, and of course, it'll be a miracle if it goes in. So you always lose one opportunity immediately. Now the next one, it's, you only get two chances. So you hit that one in easy. The ball is hit by your opponent way over to the other side of the net. You run like mad to get over there. You have no chance of getting there in time to get yourself set and hit the ball. All you do is get yourself out of breath. In fact, that is a botch. You're so out of breath from the big run that you miss the next three easy balls. Those are consequences of the botch. They are therefore called, from then on, sons of botches. <laughs> His humor is never at the expense of anyone else. He's a man of goodwill. He's fascinating to be around and stimulating and fun. He's a modest man, and he's probably won almost every award that you can imagine he might have won because that's just who he is. And to have his name associated with the Founders Award and have it be known that the Keck Foundation enabled this seemed quite a wonderful way to, to reward both Psy and do something which would ultimately continue to benefit science and engineering over the long term.